Well, good morning again, church. It is a honor and a privilege to be able to stand up and share uh, God's word with you today. I always uh, enjoy doing that. And uh, when Pastor Neil and I began to Uh, make our plans for what we were going to do on this day after our original plans uh, got sidetracked. If you remember, the series that Pastor Neil is going through is uh, walking through the Baptist faith and message. And well, what our doctrinal statement has to say about education was coming up. So we were like, that's the day. Uh, So if we're going to preach on graduation Sunday, education is certainly a fitting topic. Um, The Baptist Faith and Message has this to say about education. This is what our church's stance uh, on the topic is. And this is a paraphrase, but this is the part I I wanted us to, uh, to get to see this morning. Christianity is the faith of enlightenment and intelligence. Moreover, the cause of education in the kingdom of Christ is coordinate with the causes of missions and general benevolence and should receive along with these the liberal support of the churches. An adequate system of Christian education is necessary to a complete spiritual program for Christ's people. In other words, we here at Ridgecrest view education as essential to our growth and discipleship uh, as believers. But while we acknowledge that uh, uh, the temporal things of this world exist and they are important, uh, what we are in the business of is eternal things. So when we're talking about uh, Christian education, this morning we're going to dive into God's word and see what role that plays in our lives. What are we even talking about when we say Christian education? And why is that important? And then ultimately, what do we do with it? Right? Because anytime we dive into God's word, we see what he has to say to us. If we don't end with the question, what am I going to do now? because of what I've heard, then I'm shortchanging what God is trying to do in my life. Now, to do this, there's many different places we could go in God's Word because God's Word touches on uh, Christian education from beginning to end. Uh, And if you look at the Baptist Faith and Message, when the writers of that were trying to craft the statement uh, for us and, and churches that believe like we do on what our belief would be in regards to Christian education, there are 26 different passages that they reference uh, for, uh, for that statement. Now, we are not going to go through all 26 of those today. We are going to spend our time uh, really focusing uh, on just one, 2 Timothy chapter 3. Uh, is what we're going to look at this morning. So if you brought your Bible with you, go ahead and turn over to 2 Timothy chapter 3. Uh, and we are going to look at the importance of Christian education. 2 Timothy chapter 3. If you don't have a Bible with you, the passage is going to be up on the screen for you. Uh, beginning in verse 14. But as for you, continue in what you have learned and have firmly believed, knowing from who you learned it. And how from childhood you have been acquainted with the sacred writings, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. All scripture is breathed out by God and is profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. So what kind of education are we talking about? When we dive into this letter written to this young pastor, uh, and we want to see what God is, is, is trying to teach us. What kind of education are we talking about? Because there's a lot of different things you can become educated in today. You can learn a trade. You can go to school to learn a skill. You can receive a high school education or a college education. You can study mathematics and science and engineering and medicine and music and theater and and a plethora of other subjects and all of those are good right there's nothing wrong with any of those but there is only one education that we can get that is eternal that is going to last and we're talking about being educated in God's Word we're talking about being educated in the things of the Bible And when Paul tells Timothy here that he's been acquainted with the sacred writings in verse 15, that's what he's referring to. In this specific instance, he's referring to the Old Testament, right? But bringing that principle over to us today, it encompasses all of the Old Testament, the New Testament, all of God's word. 
We're talking about being educated in God's word in the things of the Bible. And there's so much that we could learn in here. This book touches on so many things, right? It's, it's, if you've got an inner nerd like I do, you, there's so many things you can get lost in here. You can learn history from this book. You can learn science in this book, right? You can, uh, uh, when you study the words of Jesus, he gave the Pharisees a lesson in, meteoro in meteorology. There's astronomy that's in here. All of the, it, it's so cool to see all that, but none of that is the purpose of this book. When this book speaks on those things, it's true, but the purpose of this book is to give us the things of God, is to teach us the things God would have us to know. Now, anytime you're going to learn something, what is of utmost importance is how trustworthy is the source of what you're studying. Right, and for our graduates, for our students, uh, for, for those who are in high school and in college right now, you see this the further along you go in your education. Uh, whenever I first, I think the first research paper I ever had to write was in uh, fourth grade. We had to write a research paper on a uh, classical composer. Uh, and back then, when you're that young, they would take you to the library and you could pull out encyclopedias and you could use that as sources. And then the older you got, come to find out, you're not allowed to do that anymore, right? Whenever you go to write something, if I want to make an argument in school and give that to somebody else, I better be able to back it up. And Wikipedia is not a source that colleges and, and high schools accept because anybody, it's like the, the Facebook of information. You can put any, anybody can put anything on there. You can't trust it enough to be able to really learn to the point that you would stake your life on what you're being taught. So if I'm going to learn the things of God from this book, how authoritative, how trustworthy is this book? And Paul tells us that. He tells Timothy here that all scripture is breathed out by God. Your translation may say inspired. It, that, it means the same thing. It means breathed out. What he's telling Timothy, what he's telling us, is this book was written as a letter for you and for me from the God of the universe. Almighty God wrote something down and gave it to us. So if the perfect God of the universe decided to write something down, it's something we ought to pay attention to. To the point that we could never in good conscience put anything above or on a higher plane than this what God wants us to realize is everything that we do our lives our purpose all of it should be rooted and grounded in what this book says and if that's true for we to not pay attention to this book and learn what God is trying to teach us so when we ask what kind of education are we talking about we're talking about being educated in the things of God with what he has taught us in here so, how do we do that? How do we learn what this book says? Because you don't just wake up one morning knowing it all. When you become a Christian, it's not like somebody gives you a file that you can plug into your brain and download everything and now you've got all the information. It doesn't work that way. So, looking at what God's word says, how does he expect us to learn this? Number one, we have to be taught. We have to be taught. And Paul here when he's writing to Timothy, reminds Timothy that he's had some teachers. Timothy has had some teach, teachers to teach him these things. He says, continue in what you have learned and firmly believed, knowing from who you learned it and how from childhood you have been acquainted with the sacred writings. So who has been teaching him? Number one, he's had Paul. He's had godly teachers in his life, godly uh, men and women that he served with, pouring into him but one of those is Paul and Paul is reminding him here hey remember what I've taught you but it wasn't just godly teacher family pouring into him and I can't stress to you how important this is right we, we could never we could never exhaust that but he says remember from a childhood how you've been acquainted with the sacred writings when you go back to 2nd Timothy chapter 1 Paul reminds him that it's his mother and grandmother that originally taught him what God's word said. I can't stress to you how important it is. 
for godly teachers and for family to be pouring God's word into somebody else. So do you have kids at home? Do you have a spouse at home? Do you have extended family? Do you have people that you could be pouring God's word into? Because we are called to do that. Now you may say that you don't have anybody at home to pour into you. You want to learn, but there's nobody there that poured that was pouring into you. Maybe, and I get that. I get it. Not every person growing up has a mom or a dad that's a believer in Jesus to pour into them. Or maybe mom or dad got saved at a late age and they're learning. They're not re- like they're not ready to be teaching you the ins and outs of this book yet. I get all that. And you know what? Even more importantly than me getting it, God gets it. God believes that you learning this book is so important. He makes you a promise that if you want to know his things, he himself will teach you. He says in John chapter 14, but the helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all that I have said to you. So how do we learn the things of this book? We have to be taught. Let God teach you. When you get saved and his Holy Spirit comes to live inside you, he's going to teach you God's things. Let him. Family should be a place where God's word is poured into each other. We need to start doing that. And then we need to have godly people in our lives that are teaching us his word. So we have to be taught. We also have to see it. We have to see it. Look back at verse 10. You, however, have followed my teaching, my conduct, my aim in life, My faith, my patience, my love, my steadfastness, my persecutions and sufferings, which happened to me at Antioch, at Iconium, and at Lystra, which persecutions I endured, yet from them all the Lord rescued me. When you read the New Testament, you learn some things about Timothy, like he was a disciple of Paul. He traveled with him. So Paul is going around, all around the Mediterranean. He's planting churches. He's leading people to Jesus. He's serving the Lord. Timothy is in the group of people that are going with him. So Timothy is able to see Paul not just preach God's word, but actually live it out. He's able to watch Paul whenever Paul would go and talk about how if you're going to live for Jesus, you're going to be persecuted. And then he would watch Paul go and be stoned outside the city gates and left for dead. Whenever he would listen to Paul talk about how God, Christ can do all things through him, and then he would watch Paul go into a synagogue where they should have killed him, but yet a revival happens. Or him get run out of town, but him go to the next town and be able to preach the gospel there. Timothy would see all of this happen in Paul's life, so he wasn't just being taught it, He was being shown it. Are we showing it to other people? I I shared this with the first service. This is probably one of the biggest convictions I have whenever I sin. Sin bothers me because it's a slap in the face to God. Right? That's the number one reason sin should bother us. But it also bothers me because it's my job to teach other people. And whenever I don't, whenever I sin, now that hurts my credibility with somebody else. Now that can put a stumbling block in somebody else's way of coming to Jesus or growing in Jesus. When we don't live it out, how can we expect somebody to believe what we're saying? Timothy, he learned it because he was taught it and then the people that were teaching it to him actually showed him what it looked like. But it doesn't stop there. The one that we most often leave out is we need to experience it for ourselves. See, Timothy would follow Paul to these different places, but he wasn't just a bystander. He was serving too. He was doing things too. When you read the New Testament, you see that when when Paul got run out of a place like Berea, He told Silas and Timothy, you stay here and you keep working. I have to go to the next town. When he needed somebody to go to Thessalonica or Corinth because he couldn't go himself, he sent Timothy. When Ephesus needed a pastor, Timothy is the one who went. If we really want to learn God's word, we have to get right in there and start doing it ourselves too. Let me pose this question to you. How many of us learn better by doing? And the vast majority of us would say yes. Most people are going to learn better, not by having somebody tell them how to do something, but by doing it themselves. 
and having somebody walk through that with them. As a matter of fact, in our culture, uh, we will often mock and make fun of and put down uh, sports commentators who never played the game. And you can tell, right? If you're a sports fan and you watch sports on TV, you can tell the ones that didn't play or they weren't that good. And it's like you've got no business talking about it because you don't know. Or we'll do that with politicians who want to campaign on or talk about business, but yet have never even been in business. How can we have that standard for the rest of the world if that is our stance, and yet we expect to become educated in the things of God and we never even use what he teaches us? See, if I really want to know the things of God, I can't just be taught it, and I can't just be shown it. I actually have to go out there and do it. Several of our students are either at or approaching that age where they are going to start driving, right? Uh, I used to, whenever I sold insurance, I used to love that day because that meant I was getting paid, right? Right? For those of you who've had a teenager, you know what happens to insurance rates. That was a fantastic day for me. Now I've got one that is a teenager, and I dread that day. But there's a reason they don't give you a driver's license without you actually getting on the road first. Because you can learn stuff in a book all day long. You can have people teach you all day long. You can see cars drive all day long. But until you get behind the wheel, you don't really know. So many of us want to claim to be experts or want to say we want to grow in the things of God, but we will never even put to use what God says in here. The Bible says that I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me, but we never even push ourselves to the point where we need his strength. When you put all this together in Timothy's life, that's how you get when Paul says in verse 14, continue in what you have learned and firmly believed. He was taught He was shown, and he did, and his faith became solid. And that is what we are called to do today. That is what God wants from us. So if this is what Christian education is, if that's what we're talking about, and that's how I learn it, what's the purpose of it? What is the purpose of learning these things? And I would ask you this question. I posed it to uh, the first service, uh, particularly because our graduates were in there, but I would pose it to you too. How many of you, uh, and if there's teachers in the room, I'm sorry, because in schools I know you can't say this to a kid, but I'm the student pastor, so I will. Uh, How many of you had classes in school that you had to take, but you know they had no bearing on your life? Absolutely. That's every one of us. We all had something. Now, normally, it wasn't the one that we thought, but we all had to go go to classes just to pass, just to get through. Let me give you some examples. These are classes that uh, uh, were actually on my transcript uh, that I recently had to review for some school stuff that I'm doing. Oh, let's see. I had classes like calculus, Now, some of you are in fields, I know, where you use calculus. I am not. (laughs) The closest I get is a calculator. So, didn't have to do that. That 8 a.m. hour for that semester, totally a waste of time. The Earth's environment. That was Geology 103, where I studied volcanic eruptions and earthquakes. Yep, needed to know that. Ethics. I cannot tell you how many ethics classes I've taken. Out of all the ethics classes I've I've taken, here's what I've learned. If you're not ethical, a class ain't going to make you that way. (laughs) So, that was a waste of time. Probability and statistics. Now for, (laughs) yeah, some of y'all know. For those of you who are students and are going to go on to college, if you can avoid that class, avoid it like the plague, because that's not real math. Right? That was, uh, two plus two always equals four. There can't be a plus or minus, but in that class, there is. And then my personal favorite class that I took, the history of rock and roll music. (laughs) Now, while that uh, did broaden my horizons and introduced me to things like Hank Williams Sr. and Elvis 
and uh, gave me some great musical taste that my kids hate. I'm sure my dad wonders why he paid for that class. I don't even know that unless he's watching that he knows I took it. Um, now, I know there's a reason that those kind of classes exist. There, the, there are, and they have a purpose. And maybe you're one of those that had some of these and you put them to use every day. But every one of us has had to sit through a class in school that the only thing that we were in there to try to do was to pass it because it was going to benefit your life in no way. Somebody somewhere in some boardroom just wrote down you had to take it and that's the only reason that you're in there. Too often, church, that's how we approach this book. Come here and we study it. We talk about it, but just enough to impress our Christian friends or to get by, or to be not left out of the conversation in the small group, but that's as close as we're gonna get. Because when we really look at our lives, they are no different than the rest of the world. Our priorities are the same, how we spend our time, how we invest in our kids, what we spend our money on. They all look the exact same. We spend more time teaching our kids to throw baseballs and footballs than we do what this book says. We spend more time on our phone than we do talking with our spouse about what God may be doing in the life of one of our children or in our marriage or something like that. Matter of fact, the only sign to the rest of the world that we're a Christian is we happen to go to a place that's called a church building every so often. And that's not what the purpose of this is. It shouldn't be this way because the word of God is so much more. If we're talking about what's the purpose of our Christian education, that certainly ain't it. Paul tells Timothy what the word of God is, like why, <laughs> why this is important. Look at this, verse 15. And how from, a child, how from childhood you have been acquainted with the sacred writings which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. What he's saying from the beginning to end, Genesis to Revelation, this entire book points to how you can be made right with God and have eternal life in Christ Jesus. There is no more important message to learn on the face of the earth. I encourage our students to, to pursue their education, to find the passion God has given, given them and run with that. Take chances for that. Learn more. Do more. But if you don't get this part right, nothing else you will do in your life is going to matter. It will all end when you do. There will be no uh, eternal impact that you have in the lives of other people. But if you get this right but messed up everything else, in the end, you are still with Jesus. This is the only book, this is the only letter, this is the only message that can show you how to be made right with God. It is worth so much more than the token service that we give it so much. But then God, thank God, he could have stopped right there, right? He doesn't know me anything. He doesn't know you anything. If, he, if that's all he ever gave us, that, that's more than we could ever hope to even think about asking for. But God doesn't just stop there. Look back down here at verse 16. All scripture is breathed out by God and profitable first for teaching. That means this book is beneficial to give you the divine truths that God wants you to have. The truths that only, can only come from God. I can go to school and I can learn all sorts of math. I can learn all sorts of science. I can learn all sorts of history. I love that kind of stuff. But there's only one place I could go to learn about eternal things, to learn about spiritual things, to learn about who I am in the creator of the universe eyes. What he's doing on earth, how all this stuff fits together. There's only one place I could go to learn that, and it's in this book. It's profitable to teach us the divine truths that God wants to say to us. But it's also profitable, he says, for reproof, to rebuke me when I do wrong. Often we don't want to thank God for rebuking us when we do wrong. Nobody likes to be rebuked when they do wrong, especially for the time being. The writer of Hebrews even says that. And there are so many times I, I just know God's going to skip the rebuke and go right to punishment with me. Like I, I pushed this patience too far and that's where we're at and that's where we, uh, and, and I just feel like that's what he's going to do to me because there's times I do that, right? There are times whenever you come home with your kids 
and we've done the same thing for the 45th time and we're just gonna go right to punishment now this whole rebuke thing isn't working so we're just skipping straight straight ahead to that I get there I don't know how my wife doesn't get there more because I'm not even home with them all day and I love my kids my kids are the best in the world I know you're I know you feel the same way about your kids and you get that way too. but praise God he never gets that way with us you want to know what's wrong in your life you want to know what God has said is wrong and we should not have or should not do it can be found in here this is the only place it can be found but God doesn't just say this is wrong he also shows you how to get back right that's what it means when he says correction he's not just going to say hey you are messing up or hey that's sin he's going to say hey that's sin here's how to get back where you're supposed to be how to live a right way can be found in here and then for training in righteousness that means how to live godly in the first place too often we focus on uh, uh, those issues that the Bible doesn't specifically address and what is right what is the right decision what is the wrong decision and Paul walks us through that in some of his letters talking about the weaker brother the stronger brother there's so many passages that talk about things on how a Christian should handle things that the Bible doesn't specifically address with the students the number one issue in that is how do we handle things the Bible doesn't specifically address it's dating right because I mean when you read God's Word there's not a whole lot of that that's happening in here dads would just get together and say yep our kids are gonna get married when they get this age I think we should go back to that <laughs> but not too many people are with me so we have to address dating so how do you teach someone what is right or what is wrong in an issue like that I don't try I don't want to teach you what's right and what's wrong because I know this side over here is 100% wrong and I know this side over here is 100% right in the middle where the Bible doesn't address ah I don't want to wade into that so I do what the Bible does I teach you to focus your eyes on Jesus because if you're looking at Jesus you can't go wrong that's what he means when he says for training in righteousness not just to show us when we're wrong and how to get back right but where to keep our eyes in the first place so that we can be godly that's what he's talking about this is the only place the only place you can go that can give us how to live godly because God wrote it down for us so what do I do with all that what do I do with this once I've once I've got to this place he says in verse 14 in his in his call to Timothy but as for you continue in what you have learned and firmly believed that word continue there it means to remain or it means to abide to stay to stay fixed to be firm in what you have believed so don't let it go what you have learned don't stray away from that what you know to be true don't walk away from that the, the way uh, uh, our house is set up uh, uh, normally I'm the last one to go to bed and I'll leave the the living room uh, but our hallway shines right down into the bedroom where Sarah's sleeping so once I turn all the lights off I don't dare turn that hallway light on right because I'm happily married and I want to stay that way but what that means is I have to pay attention to what's between me and the next point on my route otherwise I'm going to run into a wall I'm going to run into a clothes I'm going to run into a dog like there's no telling how foolish would I be whenever we do that to see all of that and then just totally forget it and then just do 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 walk or walk around and hope nothing bad happens so many times we come in here or we open up God's Word or we're taught it in a class or we have a conversation with somebody and we learn the truth and then we go out into the world and we just kind of set it down and then wonder why things went south and God's like I told you we don't see people come to Jesus God told us to go talk to people about Jesus are we talking about Jesus or are we just trying to get there and we're talking about church things what do we do with it stay in the truth of God's Word don't set it aside don't leave it behind and then use it put it to use 
Don't get all dressed up for the party and then never leave the house. Paul tells Timothy here that God's word does all of this that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. That means so that we can have all the tools, all the resources that we need to go out and serve God in whatever ways he's called us to. God has called you to into the ministry, praise God. God has called you to be a stay-at-home parent, praise God. He's called you into music or to be a teacher or to be a scientist or a doctor or a plumber or a handyman or whatever it is you want to put in there. Praise God. The tools you need to serve God in your life in that role are all found in here. This is the book that will get you ready for that. What do I do with it? I stay in it and then I use what he teaches me so that I can serve him with my life, so that I can be ready and equipped for every good work. Now let me, let me say this. There are some of you out here that think you are not ready to serve him yet, that you don't know enough. And whenever that thought comes in, it comes from one of two places. The first place is fear. We are afraid that if we get out here and try to serve God, we try to minister, we try to teach somebody, we try to tell somebody, that something's going to come up or something's going to happen or people are going to say something and I'm not going to know what to say so I don't feel like I'm ready to jump off the deep end yet. The other place that comes from instead of fear is cowardice or laziness. I don't want to, so I'm just going to sit back and I've got to learn more. I'm just not ready. I've got to learn more. According to the New Testament, neither of those holds water. Neither of those are valid reasons for not serving the Lord. And I'll give you just two examples. Just two. We could, we could look at a ton. The apostles, the guys that Jesus said were going to go lay the foundation of the church to be missionaries in places where the gospel had never been preached. So think about this. They're going to places like if I was to be called to be a missionary today and were to go to Pakistan, that's the equivalent of what they're doing. A place where it has never been hurt. People don't even know the word Jesus. They got no mission board behind them. They've got no language training. They got no formal, none of that. They got three and a half years of training before Jesus sent them out to do that. And I've been sitting in church for how long and I've got a hard time talking to my neighbor about Jesus? Another example, when we think that we haven't learned enough. The first evangelist in the New Testament, I love this, I, I, use, I use this illustration all the time because it teaches us so much. The first evangelist in the New Testament is a woman who had a conversation with Jesus, got saved, and then based on what she found out in that conversation, went back and evangelized her whole town and brought them to Jesus. You may not know much, you may not even be able to quote John 3.16 out of this book. That's fine. If you have a relationship with Jesus, at the very least, you can tell somebody else what Jesus has done for you. You may not be ready to, to lead a small group Bible study, but you can talk about what Jesus did in your life. Jesus isn't looking for the smartest. He's looking for the most willing. Not knowing enough of God's word is a great reason to learn more. It's a poor excuse to serve less. Not knowing enough of God's word is a great reason to learn more. It's a poor excuse to serve less so what do we do with it stay in it and then get out there and use it and it doesn't have to be around the world it can it can be and should be in your homes here workplace neighbors friends the grocery store whoever wherever if I can I want to talk about Jesus there are times, like, I don't believe you got to go around and, you know, be decked out in all the late Christian clothing and stuff, right? Like, you can take that. The skit guys have a great skit about that if you've ever seen it. Like, you can take that stuff a little bit too far. But there are times that I will wear it in places just so people will ask. Just so I can try to start a conversation. What are we going to do with what we learn? Where can I go and take this? Who can I talk to? That's what I would encourage you to think about today. This letter to Timothy is the last letter we have uh, that Paul wrote. And in it, when you read it, you find out Timothy uh, is going through a hard time. 
He's pastoring and he's discouraged. He's down. So Paul is writing him this letter to encourage him to keep going and to not forget what he knows to be true. And that is why we put such an emphasis on Christian education here. We know what is true can ultimately and only be found in God and we need to be using what we learn to be true. That was my challenge to our graduates. That's my challenge to all of us today is to take the education that we have, to take God's word and use it and then learn more. Because that's the awesome thing about God. When I take what I know to be true and I go out there and use it, I learn something else. Or I become more solid in what I knew whenever I first went out. Because I, I also told the first service, and I'll tell you now, the older I get, the less that I know for sure. Like I'm, I don't know nearly as much as I thought I did when I was a teenager. Hint, hint. But what I do know I'm much more rock solid in. I would encourage you to be that way. I would encourage us to be that way about the things of God. Now, let me close by saying this. Some of you sitting in here today or some watching online may be hearing us talk about Christian education and the things of God and you don't have a relationship with this God. The main reason that we take and proclaim the message of this book is the same reason or the same central truth that this book points to all throughout. And that is this book answers the hard questions about life and shows us that each and every one of us that are sitting in here, from the smallest child to the oldest adult, are greedy, sinful, selfish human beings who have a sinful nature and are separate from God because of our sin and God lets us know there ain't a thing in the world we can do about that and we deserve to be punished for it but he is so awesome and loves you and me so much that he sent his son and his son said yes to come down and pay for our sins and die for our sins and when Jesus Christ died for you and me on that cross he took the sin that you had and that I had and put it on his sinless imperfect self and then took the righteousness that he had and put it on us. So that anybody who would say yes to Jesus and accept him by faith could be saved and have eternal life and never face the judgment of God for their sins. And not just that, they could have a relationship with God. That we don't have to serve sin anymore. God has come inside me and made me new. He's given me a new heart, new desires. Do I still sin? Yes, but I'm not a slave to it. Anytime I do it, it's because I chose to. I belong to him now. And I've got an eternity with him secure, but while I'm here on this earth, I've got him with, with me, guiding me and using me. Who am I that God would want to use me? God doesn't need you or me. To, to spread his message. He's, gonna, he's God. He's going to do what he wants to do. He just said, I want you. He wants me. And what God has done for me, he's made available to all of us. So if there is someone here today or someone watching online that has not said yes to Jesus, that doesn't know this God we're talking about, I want you to know, he wants you to know, that the same gospel message that this book points to that saved me, he's offering to you too, if you will accept him by faith. Let me pray for you this morning, church. Father, God, I thank you for the amazing privilege of having your word, of having the message that you gave us. God, that's something that we don't deserve. Who are we that the God of the, that you, the perfect God of the universe would ever write anything down for us, but you did. God, I pray for myself and for each one of us here, for those watching online, that you would give us the passion and a growing hunger to know your things, to know you more, and to use what you teach us more. God, I thank you for the privilege that we get to do that. And Father, I pray if somebody here today or somebody watching does not have a relationship with your son, that you would convict their hearts, that they would say yes to him and make the most important decision that they could ever make. 
and have eternal life with you and then be able to learn your things and go out and serve you. God, it is an amazing thing that you want us and I praise you for that. I pray for your guidance. Help us to serve you the way you want us to. And I pray that all that we do would bring you honor and glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Church, I want to thank you for uh, the opportunity, the privilege to stand up here and share God's word with you. It is one that I do not, uh, I don't take lightly. Anytime you get to share God's word, it is an awesome, awesome day. So thank you for that. Um, I'm going to hang out up here uh, for just a little bit. So uh, if, whenever I was talking about, if you don't know the God that we're talking about in the gospel message, that this book points to. If you have never said yes to Jesus, but you did just a minute ago, or you want to know more about it, come up here and talk to me, or talk to Pastor Neil. If you've said yes to Jesus, come up here and tell us that. We had graduation Sunday because we want to mark milestones in people's lives and we want to celebrate with them. If you said yes to Jesus, we want to celebrate that with you too. If you're watching online and said yes to Jesus, it's going to be kind of hard for you, but if you want to drive on down, we'll wait. Uh, or call or text. I mean, there's, a, there's ways. We will still celebrate with you. Because that's the most important thing that you, uh, uh, that you could ever do. I'll hang around up here and I would encourage you to come up here uh, and just, just let us know. I love you, church. Thank you and I hope you have a great rest of your week. God bless. You are dismissed.